going to be part two to a video that I started when I just realized it was but taken way too long because people wanted me to talk about Rust. So hi, I'm Kevin Inouye. Uh, I wrote the Theatrical Firearms Handbook, the Screen Combat Handbook. I run Fight Designer LLC. I rent prop weapons. I do armoring work. I'm a sag after stunt performer. I'm an actor. Um, I do a lot with prop weapons. So part one, which uh, I'll, I'll link to maybe at the end of the video and below, um, talked about this whole issue of culpability. Who's to blame? Where, where charges should be filed? Who faces those involuntary manslaughter charges and why? Um, what's different about a film set versus personal responsibility with live firearms in the real world. But what I want to talk about now is this question of like, why did this even happen? And how do we stop it from happening again? Or what should have happened? Why do they even have real guns on set? What does this talk about ammunition? So let's address some of those questions for anybody who, who doesn't understand or wants to know or is curious. Let's start with why did we even have real guns on set? Now, here's the thing. There's no reason we can't have completely realistic uh, able to fire flashes and load fake ammo and look good in a close-up prop guns other than economics. It's not financially viable for anybody to make them for all the different firearms we want and it's a heck of a lot cheaper to just find a real revolver and use that safely following the proper protocol uh, than it is to get a custom-made highly functioning blank gun and multiple versions, front venting, top venting or plug barrel, and then your dummy version. And yeah, we'll, we'll cast like rubber dummy versions for stunts and stuff, but the the functioning versions, it's just not the same. And yes, you could use a rubber gun. It won't look great in close-ups. Yes, you can CG in muzzle flash and things like that, but you also don't get as good a performance. Actors need something to respond to. And, uh, you know, there have been multiple movies where they've, uh, like Once Upon a Time in Mexico, I know when they first started filming, they only had the rubber guns because the others had been stopped at the border for a while. And they had a problem with the actors couldn't stop making their own sound effects because they wanted something to like, right? They, they need something to respond to and some sense of like, a thing just happened. Um, something that does not go boom, you end up with people like faking recoil and overacting and schmacting and it's just not good, right? So are there replicas? Sure there are. You know, this is a classic uh, Denix replica. These are, are fairly popular with plays and collectors and things like that. They're this kind of cheap cast pop metal stuff. But they do have some moving parts. So if you wanted to have someone look like they are checking their, checking the, the firearm, like they are loading it. All right, can I go to Kefcock? Here's the thing, they don't completely function like the real ones. Let me see, there we go, there's a half cock. And then I can check each round, close it, and uncock it. So this can work for some of that basic action. It does not look like a real gun. Not great. I mean, in close-up, you can tell that it's this cheap cast pop metal. Yeah, you could repaint it, and it would help a little bit, but it's it's not going to hold up in a close-up. Um, they don't always function in all the right ways. Some of the moving parts move, some of them don't. These can sort of dry fire. Um, so these are perhaps better than most. Some of the semi-autos, some of the parts like safeties and things just don't even move. Um, so this is an option, but they're in limited models, uh, and they can't fire blanks or anything. Um, so there's there's nothing to respond to when it does that. There's no, no oomph, right? And that little flinch that you get from an actor when things actually <laughs> go off like that, that is something that the audience can see. And no amount of CGing things in is going to change that. Now, we do have blank firing revolvers as well. And this is these are all very similar to the ones that, uh, that Baldwin was using on set. Um, these are not legally firearms. One of the things that prevents them from being legally firearms is that the cylinder has an obstruction halfway through, which means that full-size uh, dummy rounds and blanks cannot be loaded in this prop. They go in about halfway and then they stop um, because there's an obstruction or a tapers down. And they do that so that you can only use shorter, like crimp or, or 9mm PAK blanks in these. Um, so that is, that is one of the safety things that is an accommodation to make sure that it's not readily convertible and therefore doesn't have to be treated legally like a firearm. You can buy these online, get them sent straight to your home, uh, have them on school grounds, all that kind of stuff, because they're not legally firearms, but they do go boom. They're still not completely safe. A blank is still an explosion, right? There's still hot gas and gunpowder residue and potentially little bits of brass and whatnot flying. And sometimes, like in this case, they just spray out to the sides. Revolvers tend to have some side spray. Sometimes they vent out the front. Sometimes they vent more out the top. They have a vent hole there. It's got to go somewhere. If you enclose it and it can't go anywhere, it becomes a bomb. So this particular one is uh, side venting. 
So this wouldn't really work well for movies because if you can see the thing go off, there'll be zero flash here and just like sort of a butterfly flash here. If you see it get fired up in the air, you'll see things go off to the side and nothing out the front. Plus, if it goes off here, it goes off in my face. I don't like that. So there are different limitations. And really, if you're going to stage something, you need options for different types of shots. So if I were going to be working on a, a professional level movie, I can't count on just using these. I would need to have something that was comparable, maybe in front vent, where we see, count on CGing that. Uh, definitely need something that is inert, something that ha had the ability to load dummy rounds, which this one does not, stuff like that. The other thing about blank guns is they're often just not built as well. They're often kind of low quality, um, and so they're going to jam, they're going to misfire, they're going to wear out in a way that the real firearms usually don't because they're made to much better tolerances. So there's all sorts of economic reasons why you might want a real gun instead of a, a blank firing copy. They might not also have the, the right to do trademarks. You know, if you look up closely on this, it says, uh, you know, Kimber. That's a, a company that only makes replicas. You know, Kimber, Italy, Cal 380. Uh, sometimes they'll even, you know, they'll say Denix, they'll say replica, whatever, stuff like that. Um, so th there's a number of reasons why, at least for your hero version, which is like the one you use in close-ups and stuff, you want a real gun. And then when we're doing stunts or other things, you might want a different version. You might want a blank fire only or a non-gun that can do flashes or an airsoft or solid rubber, whatever. Now, with these types of props, one of the questions is, can you tell when it's loaded? Uh, yes and no. Um, so you can put rounds into these. I'm going back to the Denix. Yeah, now here's another thing. This one is a little bit undersized. Uh, I think the originals of these were 45 long Colts. These are 38 dummy rounds, and even they don't fit in. All right, so I actually had to swap out props because the, uh, uh, the Denix did not fit 38 or any of the other blanks that I had. Um, so I'm going to look at a, an Airsoft now. Um, but it's a slightly different model, but same idea. Single action revolver loaded with the loading gate back here. So when you look at the cylinder there, you can see into the cylinder from the front, and you can see this one has a round in it, and this one does not. In this case, it's just a, a 3D printed dummy round. Um, so you can't actually tell if there's one lined up with the barrel, like in the barrel, because usually that's gonna be way too dark. In this case, it's an airsoft, and you can see the inner barrel in there, so it's a little different. Um, but with the real one, you just have a black hole there. But you can see the side, and you can see in that case, the cylinders here are empty, that one's full. So this is why we even have dummy rounds with revolvers. And yes, you can also look in here and see in this little gap in the side, you can see if there's a rim there. What you can't tell is what kind of round that is. You don't necessarily know. We can tell from the front if it's a blank round or not, but you can't see the front of the one that's lined up with the barrel without looking at it like that, which is not a very good idea unless you're on the foot. It wasn't a very good idea for him either. In order to know if it's a, a dummy round or not, that's a much harder question to answer. Right, so it's not the same as with real firearms where you're just like, oh, is it loaded or is it not loaded? It's a little bit more complex on a movie set because we have a variety of different types of ammunition. Plus, with these single actions, it's harder to, to, to quickly check. So you actually have to check one at a time with these. Does this have half cock? Some of these do, some of them don't. Right, so what we have to do is actually line up the round yeah, this one's a better example. You have to swing out the little loading gate there, put this at half cock so the cylinder can turn freely, and go through and check them one at a time, and eject them one at a time, actually, to try and see what you've actually got there. Because you have a number of options. You might have uh, a real round of ammunition. You might have a blank round of ammunition of different types. You might have a uh, fired or unfired version of either one of those. Um, you might have dummy ammunition. So let's talk about what those terms even mean. There's a number of different ways that we can make dummy rounds. A number of different ways we can make blanks. So real ammunition, you have a bullet at the end, you have a casing with a little bit of a lip, and you have a primer in the end. Now, when that primer is fired, it gets a little dimple like this. The hammer comes in, hits that, that makes that cap go off, sets off the main powder charge, sends the bullet flying out the other end. In a blank, you have primer, casing, powder, but no projectile. Sometimes they just crimp it shut at the end. Sometimes there's a little like cardboard or plastic uh, cover to keep the powder from falling out that will then either go flying out the end, like a little bit of wadding, or just oh, crack open in the case of the plastic ones. 
Um, and those can be loaded to different amounts depending on how big a boom you want. Again, blanks are not necessarily safe. Blanks can still kill, but they're not going to have a projectile, which means they have zero penetration power at any distance. They're not going to go through one person and into another. They're not going to go through a plexiglass safety shield. Um, you know, at past 10 feet, they're not going to go through a jacket. Um, a bullet obviously will. So huge difference in levels of safety, but if you put a blank gun up to your head and pull the trigger, you can still die. And that's what happened to John Eric Hexum. So the item in question now for rust for the most part is what we call dummy rounds. And this is something that is made to look like a real round of ammunition so that we can see when an actor has them on his uh, gun belt, pulls them out, puts them in, loads the revolver. Uh, we can see them in the front of the chamber when the revolver is held towards camera, which it was obviously in this shot. Um, so they, they are made to look like real rounds of ammunition, but be totally inert. No live powder, no primer, nothing. It is an inert chunk of metal, and that's all. We have a couple of different ways of making them. The, the cheapest and easiest way um, is to just take a piece of spent brass off the shooting range, which has the dimple primer, and take a new bullet and just stick the bullet in the end of the bit of spent brass. Now this is certainly doable. Obviously, I've done it myself. You can even see that I think the the slight marks from my Leatherman where I pushed that bullet into the brass. I think this was one I made on set when I needed it for something. Because sometimes you need spent brass too. And I think I had a 9mm dummy round and I had a 38 spent brass and I needed a 38 dummy round so I just pulled the 9mm bullet out and stuck it in the 38 brass because they're the same diameter. So this was kind of a quick workaround I think when I was working on that movie with Sam Akina. Um, and these are fine unless you see the back. If you see the back up close then you'll be able to tell, oh that's not a live round. It's got a dimple, it's already been fired, so. The other issue with this, is this is what happened on the crow, um, is sometimes you get what's called a light hammer strike, where it has hit the primer, but it never actually went off. And potentially, there's still a little bit of powder in that primer that could still go off. So, long story short, with the crow, they homemade some of these. Again, there's a whole backstory to this trip in the book, but, uh, then they dry fired on it and the primer went off, which is just enough to push the bullet out of the brass, but not enough to send it really flying. So it actually was still in the barrel of the gun, which they then didn't check later when they went and put blanks in it. And so then the blank provided the, the force and the bullet that was lodged in the barrel of the gun provided the projectile and that's what killed Brandon Lee. So long story short, there are potential safety issues if you are not 100% sure that the primer has actually been fired off on your dimpled primer when you make these uh, dummy rounds. You want to be 100% sure, you can have dummy rounds like this, where the primer has actually been removed or just never inserted in the first place. So if you load your own ammunition, this is what the brass looks like when you get it, and you have to get your own primers, and you put the primer in the brass, you put the powder in the shell casing, and then you seat the bullet. In this case, we have a bullet and a casing, but zero primer. So this is actually obvious from even further away that it's not a live round, but you won't see it when it's in a revolver. So if you had something like this loaded in the revolver, you'd see the bullet in the end. It would make the gun look like it was loaded. And you're not going to see the back end of the casing unless you flip open the loading gate and look at it from this angle. So for most shots, this would be just fine. And we know that it's empty because we can see that it's empty. But sometimes they want to have rounds that look like real ammunition, even in close up from every angle. That's what they had on uh, uh, Mayor of Kingstown, the shot that I talked about before. Um, and so in that case, you'll have what looks like a live primer, what looks like a full casing, what looks like a bullet at the end. And the, the casing and the bullet are real. The primer has been uh, carved out or whatever from the front side that you can't see. And so usually what we'll, they'll do with these so that you can tell them apart and not get them mixed up is where you'd normally put the powder, they'll just put a little BB. And then what you do is you rattle them and you can hear that rattling around on the inside and that tells you, oh, that one's a dummy round because no real ammunition is going to rattle when you shake it. That sound, if it ever comes up on set, it's subtle enough, and it's also, you know, sound gets doctored all the time on set anyway. It's, it's not loud enough to be obnoxious, and if, if someone for some reason shakes the ammo and it sounds too much like that, they'll just fully another sound over top of it anyway and adjust the levels. They can do that. So I'm going to guess, and this is just a guess at this point, that that's part of what they had on set of Rust, was dummy rounds like that where you could not visually tell is it a live round or not. And one reason I'm guessing that is they had gun belts, Western style gun belts, you'll see it in the intro section in YouTube, where you can stick bullets in the little loops, stick rounds of ammunition, so that when you want to reload, you can just pull one out of your bandolier on your belt, pop it in, etc. cetera. Um, and that makes the back end very visible. So if you had 
a bunch of these in your gun belt, every time they see your waist, they're gonna know, oh, this person's carrying fake. Now, of course, there's other, other types. This is, this is a, a snap cap. Uh, I think this is like one of the Azum snap caps I just spray painted. Um, so this was made to, for dry firing practice. And you can kind of tell and feel if you get up close that it's inert. Um, there's also stuff like this. These are sold as dummy rounds from an airsoft company. Um, and they're, they're not bad, but you can kind of tell, if nothing else, from the complete lack of any trademarks on the rim. <laughs> and the, the difference in weight, that these are, are not live ammo. I mean, we've talked about why we might have real guns. We've talked about why we need what looks like real ammo on set. The big unknown question right now is why the hell was there live ammo on set? There have been rumors that people were taking the real props and going out and like shooting cans for fun between takes or on breaks or weekends. Bad idea, really, really bad idea, stupid idea. Live ammo does not go anywhere near your prop guns. That is a very important rule. Uh, you've got to keep stuff separate. From what we've heard most recently, there were, I think, at least five live rounds that have since been found in other places, including in one of the other gun belts that was used in a recent scene, uh, including on the, the cart rolling around with all the other extra ammo. Um, this is basically playing Russian roulette with your camera crew and your actors to have live ammo on set get mixed in. Um, and like I said, when there's a lot of time pressure on a film and TV set, and so, when people are saying, okay, let's go, let's go, give me some dummy rounds, and you just, if someone just grabs them, like the first AD did in the set, which they should never have done, but they did, from an unintended cart, which had never been unintended, but it was, um, someone grabs those uh, and puts them in the belt, well, now we're not keeping track anymore. Now maybe it goes back to wardrobe instead of the armor, which again, it shouldn't, but these things happen on set in the chaos of all these moving parts. And so now it's not in the armorer's hands and they're like, oh, this came from wardrobe and the wardrobe would never put live ammo in a belt, right? So this is why, circling back to my part one video about whose responsibility is this stuff, which is different from whose fault. Um, it is not necessarily the actor's responsibility or any other crew person's responsibility besides the armorer and maybe the first AD. Uh, to check this stuff, it is always your right. You always have the right to stay, stop, hey, 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 hang on, can you show me what you got in there? Can, can you, how do I know that that's dummy rounds? Uh, how do I know that that gun is not gonna shoot me <laughs> or shoot somebody else? Uh, what is this gonna do if I pull the trigger? You need to know that before you pull the trigger or even before you wave it around, right? You need to know what kind of prop you've got as an actor. And you have the right to know what kind of prop somebody else has if they're barging in and waving a gun at you. So all of this stuff is established protocol. And these rules have been in place on any professional set for, for decades and decades now, uh, with only a few notable accidents. But those accidents are always tragic when they happen. Incidents, accidents, that's debatable. When people follow the rules, problems don't happen. Multiple things have to go wrong for someone to get hurt. But we've seen that happen. Uh, with John Eric Hexum, we saw it happen with Brandon Lee, we saw it happen with, with uh, Alec Baldwin. Um, and and the sin, I don't know why we, our whole celebrity culture, it makes me a little bit sad that, that we're, we're still using his name to talk about this uh, instead of Ms. Hutchins, the, the um, cinematographer who was shot. So we have rules in place, but they're more pro, they're protocol, not rules. They're not laws. Um, and so, especially given our system of sort of apprenticeship, and mentorship that that happens in terms of how we end up with new armors, you know, father daughter, as was happening with, the, with uh, Gutierrez on Rust. Um, it's not set down in guidebooks, easy for anyone to see. I mean, that was part of my motivation for writing the theatrical firearms handbook was to have a set of written guidelines because you've got people who who don't get to apprentice with someone and are kind of BSing it as they go. But there's also a, a, a new initiative going on right now that's probably going to take a while. I was contacted by some folks this uh, last year uh, about work that just started this week. Um, it's a, a working group to develop safety standards similar to like you might have with like ANSI certification, uh, like OSHA kind of stuff basically. I mean, it's voluntary, but then when you don't follow those rules and something happens, the obvious question is going to be like, well, you knew, did you not know these universal rules existed or did you just choose to ignore them and think you knew better than everybody? Um, and you don't want to be in that seat ever. <laughs> so it is uh, it is a, a uh, American National Standards Institute safety standards project for weapons safety and entertainment productions, which has been approved uh, by the Entertainment Services and Technology Association and its technical standards programs. That's a lot of anagrams there. 
But basically, they're getting a group of people together who work professionally. Uh, we've got folks from ESS um, Weapons on, in LA. We've got uh, one of the guys from Boland Effects down in Florida, it makes planks and things. Um, and this is not just about prop guns, but obviously that's at the forefront of most people's minds right now. Um, but just to develop some, some sort of lowest common denominator base guidelines about when you have prop weapons on set, what are the best practices to make sure that you're keeping everybody safe? Uh, I think things like that will help. I think things like the SAFD Theatrical Firearms Safety Course, which is a, usually a two-day intensive where you get a little certificate of completion, you take a written test, there's a practical test. That's aimed primarily at use of blanks, mostly in live theater, but exactly how it's biased depends on who's teaching it uh, and what they want to cover. Um, uh, I think things like the Theatrical Firearms Handbook that I wrote hopefully helps. I think things like the, the guidelines from SAG-AFTRA in their safety bulletins and by Actors' Equity in their stage manager's packet, um, by IATC, uh, all these professional organizations have something. But it's not always the most useful and not always the most relevant to whatever you happen to be doing. That's always going to be the case, right? No national organization trying to cover everything will be just right for what you need which is why you need to hire a professional. And as we talked about in the first video, one of the most important qualifications of that professional is they need to be able to look you in the eye, and I don't care if you're the star, if you're the producer, you're the director, they need to be able to look you in the eye and say, no, no, I'm not gonna do that. You can't do that. And if you try to do that, I'm gonna take my toys and I'm gonna walk away because I will not be a part of unsafe practices on set. You've got to be able to do that. And if you can't do that, this is not the job for you. So this two-part series has maybe been a little less fun than some of my videos. I'm not showing off new toys. I'm not looking at cool effects. Uh, uh, I'm not sharing a lot of cool footage. Uh, but you know what? Sometimes we need a little sobering check-in to remind us that when you don't follow the rules, people can get hurt. And there's reasons those rules exist, and you ignore them at your own peril. So I hope this has been useful and has answered some questions for some people. Um, uh, you know, I've been interviewed by Variety and, and I've gotten emails from friends, I've had other things come in, um, and, and I'm, I'm sure they won't necessarily stop, but at least now I've got something I can send folks to. Um, so until next time, stay safe, stay sane, stay healthy, keep everybody else safe, make sure that everybody else is safer because of your presence, even if they don't like you because you told them no. And, uh, if this has been useful or if you're interested in other things, you can always like, subscribe, comment, whatever, ask me questions. I'm not hard to find online. So till next time, take care, play safe, and see you later.